Tony, thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you for the invitation to be with you. And thank you and the New Schools Project for the great work that you do. You know, they never disappoint. It's like the young husband who was approaching his first anniversary and about a week before his young bride was at breakfast and she said, you know, honey, I had a dream last night. I had a dream you brought me this beautiful, beautiful present. And when I opened the present, there was this gorgeous strand of pearls just like the ones in the window at the jewelry store on Main Street. So sure enough, the next week, their anniversary came, and he brought her this. She asked him, she says, now, honey, what does that dream mean? I've always wondered what that dream would mean as we approach our anniversary. So sure enough, the next week on their anniversary, he came to his wife. He gave her this beautiful present, and she tore into it, and there was Sigmund Freud's book entitled The Meaning of Dreams. <laughs> Tony's not like that. He never disappoints. He does great work. You're, I thank you for being here. You're going to have a great conference. You've got Tony Wagner uh, later in your conference, and he is certainly one of the leading uh, leaders in uh, innovation in the nation today. We're certainly proud of our state's legacy in innovation. I have talked about a restless energy that has always existed in North Carolina. You know, we're proud of the fact that we were pioneers. The first English colony started right here in our state. The Wright brothers came here to fly that first airplane. The nascent act of the North Carolina legislature, when we became a country and when North Carolina became a state, was to create the first public university in the nation. That was very significant. There were great colleges at that time, Princeton, Harvard, Yale, William & Mary, but you had to be rich to go there. North Carolina said if you have the desire, the ability, then you're going to have the opportunity to improve yourself through education. We've had visionary leaders who saw fit to extend that to a great community college system to make education affordable, accessible to every one of our citizens. And it is the most excellent community college system today. And we had the vision to create places like Research Triangle Park, where we are today. It is such a fitting place to have a scaling STEM conference because truly RTP is one of the STEM capitals of the world today. It was a vision to marry business and marry education and leverage the great research that is in this area. As you know, there are three major research universities in the RTP today, UNC, NC State, and Duke, along with many other schools and there is an excellent workforce, and that was a major reason for its success. This is a perfect place to hold this scaling STEM conference. Today, RTP is a leader in biotech and cancer research. It's one of the reasons that North Carolina ranks number three in biotech today in the nation. About 45,000 people work in RTP, including IBM's largest North American presence, and it's one of the largest pharmaceutical research and development centers in the world today. But not only that, it helps drive the rural economy. The companies in RTP today have call centers and manufacturing centers in our rural areas. No question it's one of the STEM capitals of the world today, and it's right here in North Carolina. But in North Carolina, we need to scale these STEM programs out throughout our state and make sure all of our students have that opportunity for the most excellent programs. As we focus on the economy, we see a nation that is in transition, and STEM education is in transition to some degree. It reminds me of quotes by Yogi Berra. I think he needed some STEM education. I don't know if you know who Yogi Berra was. He was a great baseball player known for some witticisms. But Yogi would say things like, now everybody pair up in threes. So, um, but Yogi also said, the future is not what it used to be. The future isn't what it used to be. Well, Yogi was right. The future is not what it used to be. We're not just competing with other states. We're competing with India and China. Everybody talks about, oh, those manufacturing jobs went to India and China. Yes, they did. But what they also need to understand is IT jobs and radiology jobs and engineering jobs and accounting jobs are also going to India and China. They email the information there and then get it back. We've got to step up our game. The world is changing, but change is inevitable. The great baseball player Ty Cobb was 70 years old. He retired to his hometown 
of Rome, Georgia, and a sports writer came to interview him and said, Mr. Cobb, I've looked at your history. You're one of the greatest baseball players of all time. You're in the Hall of Fame. You hit 406. Only a handful of baseball players ever hit over 400. You had a lifetime batting average of 364. Nobody ever has had that. That is it, it, so far ahead of anybody else. But the thing that impressed me most, Mr. Cobb, is you played 24 seasons, 23 of those you hit over 300. Nobody will ever match that. But, Mr. Cobb, you know, the game is changing. The pitchers are bigger. They're throwing the ball faster. The curveball looks like it's coming off a cliff. If you were playing baseball today, Mr. Cobb, what do you think you would hit? Cobb thought a minute and says, I don't know, 255, 265. Sports writer says, you, you really think so? Would it be that much difference? He said, hell, man, I am 70 years old. <laughs> times are changing. Whether we like it or not, Ty Cobb didn't like it, but times are changing, and education is changing, and we must innovate in education to, to address those changes. Why are things changing? Because in this next year, 1.5 exabytes of unique new information will be created. I have no idea what an exabyte is, but I will tell you it's equal to all of the unique new information created before the year 2000 and 5,000 years before. That's how fast information is coming at teachers. That's how fast information is coming at students. Another way of saying it is someone once said we can't rely on the graveyard method of teaching anymore. The graveyard method being Line them up in rows, expect them to be quiet, and learn. That doesn't work anymore because information is coming so fast. What you learn today may be obsolete tomorrow or certainly evolve in a quick period of time. So students know how to engage. They have to know how to analyze. They have to reason in time. So we're proud to be a leader in, in innovation in North Carolina. I did sponsor the Innovative Education Act that laid a foundation for the early colleges, one method of trying to customize learning to some degree. It has been a great success, as Tony said. The New York Times has said that model is a model for the nation. We have one-third of the early colleges in America today. Seven of the top ten high schools last year for graduation rate were early colleges, and 60 percent of those students are first generation. So I thank Tony and New Schools for the great job that they are doing. I also chair something called the Jobs Commission, joining our businesses and schools, which is an attempt to align our early colleges with the job needs of the future and engage businesses in those models. One reason I wanted to form that was an early college right here in Wake County at Wake Med. I went over there and toured it, and it's fo uh, focused on allied health. They enter in the ninth grade, and for the first two years, their class is on the Wake Med campus. Their certified teachers are there, but the doctors and nurses come by, they lecture, they let them job shadow in the white coats in the hospital, and for the last three years they go to Wake Tech. I saw that model and said that is a great way to involve businesses in our schools. So we've taken that model and we've recommended or been involved in some prototypes, I think, that will be very good. In the northeastern part of our state, there are five counties that are rather small, that don't have the tax base sometimes to do what they want to do for education. But because of Tony's work and others, we were able to get those five counties to come together to say we want an excellent STEM program, agri-science, agribusiness program here in the Northeast, and let's anchor it with NC State, and they will help with the curriculum. And they're going to open that school next year, and then we hope to make a sister school at the Kannapolis campus. Here in Wake County, the North Carolina State STEM initiative with Wake County, looking at the grand challenges of engineering, but the investor-owned utilities and others involved in energy are supporting that school as well as the Association of Engineers. To compete, it is going to be essential to have a STEM smart workforce. In order to make sure that we get STEM out to everybody, you'll hear Sam Houston later in the day, but Sam says STEM should also stand for strategies that engage the mind. I like that, and that's the way we deliver STEM, I think, with strategies that engage the mind. And when we focus on STEM and have these STEM high schools, I think you'll see that. I talked to a young man not too long ago, and I said, why are you at this STEM school? He says, because I want to be a rocket scientist. 
Now, it was an early college, but I thought that was a great answer. Your traditional high schools have a flashing light that says, come here and we will teach you math and physics and English and history. This school said, come here and you can be a rocket scientist. Now, they're going to teach you math and history and English and physics, but that's the way he saw it. That real-world connection caught that young man's imagination, and that's what we need to do because STEM is going to be in everything that we do, not just scientists and doctors. It's going to be in auto mechanics and landscaping and agribusiness. STEM is going to be king. STEM jobs are going 23% faster than jobs in other sectors. More and more jobs are requiring STEM skills. Almost two-thirds of all North Carolina jobs will require a post-secondary credential, and almost all of them will need STEM skills. That's why STEM is so important. As we teach STEM, we need to be more innovative in our approach and change the way we teach. The Jobs Commission also has a STEM Advisory Council that participated in a statewide STEM education strategy. Last November, the State Board of Education adopted that strategy. North Carolina has amazing resources that will benefit students at all levels, but we need to do a better job of coordinating and sharing those resources. In fact, at the Jobs Commission, we found out that there are over 500 separate STEM programs in North Carolina today. That's a lot. What we want to do and what we have proposed and is now launched on March 1st, 1st is the North Carolina STEM Learning Network. We have joined together the universities and the community colleges and the public schools to try to coordinate with those 500 programs and others that are coming up. And having a clearinghouse to some degree so when somebody has a STEM program, hopefully they go to the STEM Learning Network and say, we've got this great program, we want to implement it. And you may say, well, look at the program in Kenston or look at the program in Winston-Salem and see if it's not similar. Nonprofits like it because there is someone that will be looking over this and coordinating it. And here's the key to it, I think, though, that once we get this online, hopefully it is somewhat insulated from any political process. So no matter who is in what office, that we have a viable, sustainable STEM program that is most excellent that will be able to be delivered to our students. That's what that network is all about. It is also a way to encourage the business community to join in advancing STEM education for all North Carolina students. Businesses just like the ones right here in RTP. Through the network, we can share our best efforts throughout the state and solicit businesses, agencies, and others to help you prepare our students for skilled jobs in a rapidly changing environment. The ultimate goal is to graduate more student, students with STEM skills, which will prepare them for the 21st century job. North Carolina has the knowledge to be a leader in STEM. We are blessed with so many resources, and now we have the will and a plan to harness those resources and share them. Making STEM a national priority will pay dividends to our national economy and our shared future. It is an exciting time. Tremendous opportunities are ahead. You are the leaders in this room, and I thank you for that leadership. This morning as I came over here, I heard that they're moving the space shuttle Challenger back to the Smithsonian Museum. It remind me, reminded me of Krista McAuliffe, who was to be the first woman in space. But someone, as you know, she was a teacher, and she would have been the first teacher in space. Someone asked her, what do you do? Her response was, I touch the future. I teach. I visited a STEM school, as I said, not long ago, and that kid said he wanted to be a rocket scientist. That's what we need to do is capture that dream and dream big. That's what North Carolina needs. We are declaring the graveyard method of teaching dead. We will innovate in North Carolina. We will have the power to touch the future. Joanne Higginbotham, an African-American female astronaut, once said that somebody told her, the sky is the limit. She said, no, 